Philly makes a statement win against the defending NBA champs. And then after being fouled 118 times in the past five games, travels to Minnesota and sends the message that if you want problems, we're in your chest. They take care of business on the road and run Minnesota off the floor. As always, this starts with the offensive play. But you know me, bro. Let's talk about As it. As the Sixers get fully acclimated, fully healthy, and more comfortable, they're relying on their playbook as a heavier source of offense more than usual lately. That's a really good thing though. The players are out there understanding what they have to do, and that's also indicative of really good chemistry. I don't know, I might be crazy, but I feel like I've seen more offense in what, 20 games of Sixers basketball than I have in the past four years. Let's chop it up about the playbook though. If you've watched any of my videos, you could probably predict what's coming. Shake's taking the handoff from Tobias and he's getting a screen from Dwight. Here's why it's so effective though. Shake gets a head start to get downhill and this giant dude Dwight gets in the way. So the ball handler isn't worried about the defender behind him and he has more than enough space to get to a spot and just dissect the defense. But now, okay, we're seeing variations. We all know where the screens are coming from, but the fun part is making the dude that's checking you play tag. The worst part about it for the defender is that you've got to catch your man, and you've got to fight through two screens in doing that, because you want to get to him before he gets the ball and can go to work. And credit to D'Lo, he didn't lose that battle. Okay, see, na now you're just being disrespectful, Philly. No look off the screens for Philly, no problem. They turned it into a two-man game. So essentially, the Sixers are breaking a game of fives down into a game of twos. We recognize this, look. We don't care about you right now. We're talking about the two-man game. Basically, you're taking your ball handler and a big and saying, my two are better than your two, uh, so we're gonna go get a bucket right now. And the best part about the two-man game is that it's OP, it's overpowered. You can literally use it and rely on it the entire game and there's no limit to how many times you can use it and to the Sixers advantage they probably have like four or five ball handlers that could cut up in the two-man game and to be honest wait something's different about this look so what's the difference between this look and the shake Milton look that we started the video with Seth isn't taking the handoff from Danny Green Danny Green setting the screen for him to give him a head start to take the handoff from MB and if DG draws the slightest bit of contact on this screen that means the play has basically worked because the premise is really simple you're just trying to get the ball into Seth Curry's hands and give him an opportunity to cut up in space if the screen from DG alters the path of the on-ball defender at all and he's got to play tag with Seth Curry taking a handoff from Joe, the Sixers have gotten what they wanted. The screen works and Seth takes a... That's not a handoff! That was a whole halfback toss! Anyway, you couldn't have executed that any better. Hold on, let's talk about the two-man game again. Alright, so Minnesota's one-on-one, -on -one, man to man everywhere. Yeah, it's a game of fives, but the ball handler and the screener are on their own island. So it's a game of twos now. And because it's man to man everywhere, there's not much help defense in this game within the game. Let's think about it in multiple perspectives. From the ball handler and the on-ball defender's perspectives, it's a one-on-one. -on -one. And then this seven foot tree of a human plants himself in the middle of the court somewhere. If you're Shake Milton, this is a care package, right? Like this is when you're playing 2K and you call for a screen. You know why you did it, everyone does it. You're getting a bucket, you don't have to do anything. But if you're Ricky Rubio, the defender here, you're not getting through that Joel Embiid screen, so you better turn into an athlete and get around it. It's too late though. Thanks to the screen, Shake already hit his spot. And if the screeners continue to draw legal contact on the screens, there's no reason why the playmakers can't continue to hit their spot. There's no consistent starting lineup combination, especially on contending teams that has more free throw attempts, a high free throw attempt rate, or personal fouls drawn than the Sixers starting five. They have a plus 40 differential in free throw attempts in the past six games. Why? Because they're playing bully ball. In space, they're getting one-on-one -on -one matchups. And in most cases, it's either a bucket or a foul. I'm just saying. Hey, Ed Davis, tonight, tonight you will go one-on-one. -on -one. With the I don't make the rules. Come on, look at the spacing. When it's time for Joe to go to work, he sees nothing but dog food. You already know, three spacing the floor around the perimeter, one-on-one -on -one for Joe. What? 
Joe's bullying, dude. All right, let's see what Joe sees from the post every night. Three green light shooters around the perimeter and Ben near the dunker. Most importantly though, Joe's got eyes on anybody that could play help defense and potentially take the ball away from him. Either Minnesota's defense doesn't want smoke with the MVP and they're comfortable letting the Undertaker snatch bodies, or Philly shooting is just so good that they can't double team Joe. But either way, Ed Davis, do you want to dance? Right foot up, left foot, get him gone. Wait, not the foul, not the ball, oh my God. Watch how roll definition works. The Sixers are bringing the big man on the block back. The offense runs through the Undertaker, so after DG makes this entry pass, he's getting out of the way. He takes this path to make the defense respond to the action and pull them away from doubling Joe. It's one-on-one man-to-man -on -man everywhere, so the Undertaker gets Ed Davis dog food served on a platter. Come on. Not again. Ed Davis, do you want to dance? Oh, that was... Get him gone, coach. Hold on now, wait a minute. You look familiar. I see it's three around the perimeter. Definitely one near the dunker. Huh. Ben's got eyes on anybody that could play help defense. Huh. Oh, now I remember. It's a bucket. I thought I recognized you. Oh, a lot of lines. What does this mean? It's pretty simple, actually. So there's three shooters around the perimeter spacing the floor. Okay, I see that. It looks like there's one near the dunker. Okay, nothing out of the ordinary. There's kind of this guy averaging almost 30 points per game fourth in the NBA that sees the entire floor from the top of the key and gets a one-on-one -on -one matchup to do whatever he wants. So he does what he knows best and takes it to the post. Oh my, oh, oh my God, no he didn't. Hold on now, wait a minute. Hold on a minute. Am I going crazy? I don't know, but you can't just be anybody and have this bag. I mean, this is one of the goats we're talking about. It's gonna be hard to top that, but you know, three shooters around the perimeter and one guy doing his thing around the paint. The bias draws a one-on-one. -on -one. And watch your head, oh, oh my God. What's gotten into you? The chemistry between Ben, Joe, and Tobias has been unbelievable, and it looks to be contagious, but when you can get the slightest bit of production from the three of these guys on a nightly basis, you're a dangerous squad. Listen, Joe took 18 free throws and made 16 of them. Joe came out of the half and got four straight buckets and scored as many points as Minnesota did in the opening six minutes of the third quarter where 16 of his 37 points came. Ben was quiet scoring. He took 10 shots, but he was facilitating, directing traffic, and spreading the rock, so he played his game. Ben starts getting downhill towards the basket, and that's where Minnesota's defensive attention shifts to. Which leads me to ask, Josh Okoge, where's your man? Ben dribble penetrates, and Ed Davis shuffles into Simmons' way to form a roadblock. The problem for the defense is that Embiid shoot 40% from three, so pick your poison. Here, you'll watch someone collapse an entire defense, which creates a wide open three-point shot for his teammate, but the box score doesn't show this, so nobody cares. For those that do care, Simmons assisted five threes in this game, and he's the league leader for assisted threes. The team shoot 40% from three with him on the floor and 29% with him off. Two dribbles from half court to the rack. Okay, so we're headhunting. But here's what confuses me. No one even jumped with you. How'd you miss that? That made a real nice move in the half court to get him downhill and get him to the rack. And I guess you could say he shot this off balance, but he had enough time to get it off and he was right near the rim. How'd he almost break it? I don't know, they won. I'm not gonna lose sleep over it. Tobias Harris, you already know what he's doing. He's out there for 35 minutes getting grown man buckets. Individually, players in the second and third unit will have their ups and their downs, but for the most part, this Sixers bench has been reliable and they've done their job. With Joe playing the way he is, they don't have to do too much. All for a scoring punch, a few defensive possessions, a couple of key rebounds, but for the most part, 
They just have to hold or expand leads. The second unit did its thing, I won't lie. They're bringing energy, they're not taking possessions off, and on different nights, different guys give you different scoring punches. There's something to think about. When at least four rotation players subbed in in the third quarter, the score was 87-72. to 72. When the third unit subbed in in the fourth quarter, the score was 108-83. to 83. So the second unit took a 15-point lead from the starters and pushed it to a 25-point lead for the third unit. Matisse has at least two steals in four of his last six games. Real briefly, let's look at the defense because Joe's impact and dominance doesn't just show up on one end of the floor. Having Joel Embiid on the floor changes a lot. The offense almost has to alter their entire approach. There's this seven foot giant that's consistently one of the most impactful defensive players in the league just wait for you to make that mistake. So more often than not, Minnesota was forced to settle. And this is why defensively, they're just as powerful as they are on offense, because you've got this dude Joe, and then Ben Simmons, 6'10", who could guard one through four. There's nothing new with the pick and roll coverage. Joe's in drop, Ben's got to fight around a screen, and now he's on the hip of or behind D'Lo, who's got too much space. Very similarly, Danny Green's got to fight to try to contest this shot, because Joe just can't. But the Sixers probably got to stick to drop coverage. Pulling your 280 pound center this far away from the basket and asking him to compete laterally with a guard is probably just too hard and that's not his fault. Look fam, that's it for me. I appreciate you hanging out with me. As always, I'll see you when I see you. I hope it's on Monday for the next breakdown, but if not, hit me up with a sub, comment below, holler at me on Twitter. Do whatever you got to do, but most importantly, stay solid, baby. Stay solid, baby.